Hi, so let us continue from where we left off last time. Last time you recall that we discussed generalized Fourier series, the need for generalized Fourier series. We looked at some examples of complete orthogonal systems. We looked at the case of the vibrating membrane, circular vibrating membrane and we got the Bessel's function. So JP zeta jx, call it phi j and we saw that they were orthogonal where the zeta j varies over the zeros of the Bessel's function jp. I mentioned to you that later we shall show that there are infinitely many zeros of the Bessel's function. We also looked at the orthogonality but remember that it's not enough to just prove orthogonality of the Bessel's functions. We also have to compute the L2 norms of these functions with respect to which weight? x dx. That's the weight of the, uh, that is the measure with, which, with, uh, with respect to which we take the L2. Now let us go a little further. We want to calculate integral 0 to 1 jp zeta x the whole square dx. So observe that x dx is the measure and this is the L2 norm of the function phi jx with respect to this measure. So we begin again with the definition of phi ux. Recall that phi ux is jp of ux and it satisfies the differential equation x squared phi u double prime plus x phi u prime plus x squared u squared minus p squared phi u equal to 0. Now at this juncture u need not be a 0 of the Bessel's function. As far as this differential equation is concerned, not yet. Later we will take it to be the 0 but we will also need information as to what happens when u is not a 0 of the Bessel's function. Multiply the differential equation by x inverse phi v and integrate over the interval 0, 1. What do we get? This x squared becomes an x phi v phi u double prime plus phi v x phi u prime x the x disappear plus x squared u squared minus p squared phi u phi v dx upon x equal to 0. Again I am going to assume that the p is not 0 and so this is an integrable business and when p is 0 it even gets better because this term disappears and straight away 1x gets cancelled out. Now what happens is that we are ultimately going to switch the roles of u and v and we are going to subtract. So if you do that then this term minus p squared phi u phi v dx upon x that term will cancel out and so I will not even bother to discuss this term in the future because this is going to ca cancel out. In the first piece we are going to integrate by parts. When you integrate by parts what happens one of the derivatives will shift from phi u double prime and it will come over here and there will be a negative sign. When it comes over here what happens there are two terms. In one term the derivative will fall on x and we will get phi v phi u prime x dx and there is a negative sign and that exactly cancels with the middle term. Then there is a other term where the derivative shifts from phi u double prime and falls on phi v. What is that term? Minus integral 0 to 1 x phi v prime phi u prime dx. Again when we switch the roles of u and v and we subtract that term also cancels out. So the terms arising by integration by parts in the first integral will cancel out except that we have to discuss the boundary terms when we perform integration by parts. Remember u is not a zero of the Bessel's function. So with these things in mind let us proceed a little further and that's exactly what I got. The integration by parts gives you three terms, two of them are integrals and the third one is a boundary term. And we explained to you why the middle integrals will drop out and the first integral will drop out of the middle term in the previous slide. So the only thing that we need to look at is the boundary term. What happens to the boundary term x phi v x phi u prime x at the lower end anyway is 0. What about the upper end? At upper end it is phi v of 1. What is phi v of 1? It is going to be j p of v. What is phi u prime x? 
What is the derivative of phi u x? The derivative of phi u x is the derivative of j p x at u times remember phi u x is j p of x u. So, so when you I have to apply the chain rule and that will produce a u outside. So, the boundary term has been written down. And then we do the switching of u and v and subtracting and what remains basically are these terms u squared minus v squared integral 0 to 1 x phi u x phi v x dx. The right hand side comes from these boundary terms v j p u j p prime v minus u j p v j p prime u. Idea is to divide by u squared minus v squared and let v tend to u. Okay. So, when v tends to u, we have to understand what happens to the right hand side. Of course, we have to divide by u squared minus v squared. So, in the limit, what we are going to get is integral 0 to 1 x phi u squared x dx equals limit as v tends to u minus u j p v j p prime u upon u squared minus v squared. You have to apply the L'Hopital's rule and you are going to get exactly one half j p prime u the whole squared. And the proof of Lommel's formula is thereby complete. Now that we have discussed this, we have obtained the solution of the vibrating membrane using the Fourier Bessel expansion and the Lommel's formula. Now we need to ask ourselves a very basic question. How do you know that the solution to this problem is unique? Maybe there is a solution is not unique. Maybe this is only one of the solutions that we got. We have to discuss this matter very completely and we proceed to do so. We shall prove uniqueness. We shall prove that this is the only solution and there are no others. Suppose Z1 and Z2 are two solutions of the same differential equation with the same initial conditions and the same boundary conditions. Then what happens is that take the difference Z1 minus Z2, call it capital Z. Then what differential equation does capital Z satisfy? The same wave equation. But what about the initial condition? Because I have taken Z1 minus Z2, the initial conditions will drop out and capital Z has zero initial conditions. The boundary conditions are anyway zero for both Z1 and Z2. So the boundary condition for capital Z also is zero. So now we are going to look at this particular problem over here. So we will show that the only possibility here is Z equal to zero. So let us proceed to do that. What we will do is we will use the energy method, something that you have seen before in the context of the wave equation. So what we can do is multiply the wave equation by zt, we will get del 2z by del t squared del z by del t. That is one half the del del t of del z by del t the whole squared. It is the derivative of zt squared. Of course, there is a one half factor which I suppressed. And then what happens is over here, you will get del 2z by del x squared into del del t. That is going to be the same as this. How did I get this? Remember that the zxx here was here and zt was here. One derivative shifted from here to there. I have done an integration by parts. I have done an integration by parts in these two terms and there is a c squared and the minus sign became plus sign. And I get this. From this we infer that the energy Et is basically conserved. What is the energy? This quantity c squared zx squared plus c squared zy squared plus zt squared. Remember this is again one half del del t of zx squared. This is one half del del t of zy squared. And there was one half here also which I sub so I have suppressed the one half in all the places there is a zero on the right hand side there is no problem. So the time derivative of zx squared if you calculate you are going to get exactly this. So this equation says that ddt of this is zero. In other words the energy et is constant in time. So since the initial value of the energy, what is the initial value of the energy? The initial value of the energy is 0 
because the initial conditions are zero and the boundary terms are also zero. The energy is identically zero means zt squared must be zero, zy squared must be zero, zx squared must be zero because the energy is an integral of squares, sum of squares. And so individually zt, zx and zy must be identically zero. So z must be constant. But z is constant, why should z be zero? Remember the boundary condition, the membrane is clamped along its rim. So the, uh, this constant must be zero itself and the proof is complete. The uniqueness has been established. Now imitate this energy method to show that a twice continuously differentiable initial value problem for the heat equation is unique. So do the same idea, not with the wave equation, but the heat equation. Again, you will have to write the energy function Et. This time, Et is not going to be constant, but it's going to be monotone decreasing in time. So there's a small difference between the two, but you will figure it out if you work out the problem. Show that the twice continu continuously differentiable solution to the boundary value problem, Laplacian of u equal to zero on d, u of x, y, z equal to f of x, y, z on the boundary is unique in D, where D is a region in R3 with a smooth boundary del T and f is a function which is prescribed along the boundary del T. Again, you can imitate the same idea, multiply the differential equation by u and integrate. Now for more discussions on these kinds of wave phenomenon, we have just touched upon wave phenomenon. There are a number of excellent books that are available which describe these kinds of things in very great detail. A classic reference is Courant and Hilbert, Richard Courant and David Hilbert's Methods of Mathematical Physics Volume 1. We already cited this earlier. The discussion of vibration of a circular plate is available on page 307-308. These involve Bessel's functions of imaginary orders IP. They are also known as a modified Bessel's function. The biharmonic equation will show up. This is something that you could look at. The other thing is the reference that I already given you, Lord Rayleigh, Theory of Sound, Volume 1, Volume 2. This is the most comprehensive account of the theory of vibrations. The discussion of the vibrating plate is also there. This is the best source on the physics of vibrations. Another application of Bessel's function is a skin effect. See Frank Bowman's introduction to Bessel's functions, Dover 1958. Bessel's function appear in optics. The radii of the successive interference fringes formed by the diffraction of light by a circular aperture. They are given in terms of the zeros of the Bessel's function. Besides the authoritative treatise of G. N. Watson, you should also look at the book of Byerly which is available for free online. Now we go to the next example, Legendre polynomials. Legendre polynomials give you another orthonormal system on the interval minus 1, 1. I mentioned to you the Legendre polynomials on L2 of minus 1, 1 forming a complete orthogonal system. So what is the Legendre's differential equation? The Legendre's differential equation is the display 5.3. 1 minus x squared y double prime minus 2xy prime plus p into p plus 1y equal to 0. The coefficient 1 minus x squared does not vanish at the origin and so the origin is a non-singular point, it is a regular point. So we can seek a power series solution of this differential equation 5.3 as a power series 5.4. So the solution that we are looking for we take it as a power series y of x equal to summation n from 0 to infinity a n x to the power n. Remember that a power series can be differentiated term by term if it has positive radius of convergence. So let us differentiate 5.4 term by term minus 2xy prime because I have to differentiate and I have to multiply by minus 2x. So minus 2xy prime. What is it going to be? Term by term differentiation. A n x to the power n is going to give you n a n x to the power n minus 1. So when you multiply by minus 2x, it will go back to minus 2 n a n x to the power n 5.5. And for the x squared y double prime term, we get x squared y double prime equal to summation n from 0 to infinity 
n into n minus 1 into a n x to the power n 5.6. So now we have x squared y double prime 2xy prime and p into p plus 1 by you simply multiply 5.4 by p into p plus 1. What are you going to get? You are going to get 3 equations 5.4, 5.5 and 5.6 all of them have x to the power n in them. Okay, now we have to deal with one more term in the differential equation y double prime. y double prime is summation n from 0 to infinity n into n minus 1 a n x to the power n minus 2. Put n equal to 0, it is 0. Put n equal to 1, it is 0. So the summation starts from 2 to infinity. Now there is a very important warning which is given in red. It is very important to arrange it in such a way that all the exponents of x in the general term should be the same. Whereas it is n in the three previous terms, it's x to the power n, x to the power n, x to the power n. Here we have x to the power n minus 2. It is utmost important to make this also n. So we make a change, we put n minus 2 equal to capital N. So when little n runs from 2 to infinity, capital N runs from 0 to infinity and we get y double prime equal to n plus 2 into n plus 1 into a n plus 2 x to the power n. n is a dummy index and so we can write y double prime is summation little n from 0 to infinity n plus 2 n plus 1 a n plus 2 x to the power n 5.7. So we combine everything together 1 minus x squared y double prime minus 2 x y prime plus p into p plus 1 y equal to all the summations are going from 0 to infinity all the x's have nth power. So n plus 2 into n plus 1 a n plus 2 minus n into n minus 1 a n minus 2 n a n plus p into p plus 1 a n equal to 0. Now this power series is identically 0 so every coefficient must be 0. So equating this coefficient to 0 we get what is called as a recurrence relation. We collect the all the a n's together and then you simplify a n plus 2 equal to minus a n into p minus n into p plus 1 plus n upon n plus 2 n plus 1 n goes from 0 1 2 3 etc. So now you put n equal to 0, 1, 2, 3 in succession and we get a2. Put n equal to 0 and we get a2. a2 is what? Minus a0 p into p plus 1 upon 2 factorial. Put n equal to 1. a3 is minus a1 into p minus 1 into p plus 2 upon 3 factorial. Put n equal to 2. When you put n equal to 2, you get a4 equal to minus a2 times something. But a2 has just been computed in the previous step. So put that. So if you keep doing this, you will get a2 and a3. a4 is again getting in terms of a0. a5 will be in terms of a1. And the law of formation is very clear. The even ones are minus 1 to the power n, a0, p into p minus 2 and da da da, p minus 2n plus 2, p plus 1, p plus 3, da da da, p plus 2n minus 1 upon 2n factorial. For the odd ones, a 2n plus 1 equal to minus 1 to the power n, a 1, all of them will have a 1, you will get p minus 1 into p minus 3 into da da da, p minus 2n plus 1 and then p plus 2, p plus 4, da da, p plus 2n minus 1, exactly what we get. So we get a 2n and a 2n plus 1. General solution is thus given by a naught into 1 minus p into p plus 1 x squared upon 2 factorial plus p into p minus 2 into p plus 1 into p plus 3 x to the power 4 upon 4 factorial minus da da plus a1 into x minus p minus 1 into p plus 2 x cube upon 2 factorial plus p minus 1 into p minus 3 into p plus 2 into p plus 4 x to the power 5 upon 4 factorial minus etc. Signs alternate in both the terms. Of course, the coefficients a0 and a1 can be given arbitrary values. So we can assign a0 equal to 1 and a1 equal to 0. So the second piece completely drops out and a0 is 1 and I get one solution. On the other hand, I can put a0 as 0 and I can put a1 as 1 and I get the second solution. So when the first one was an even powers, second one involved only odd powers. So the first one is an even function and the second one is an odd function. Both of them are power series. Now you check using the D. L. Lambert's ratio test that each of these two series will have unit radius of convergence except in one situation when p is an integer. For example, if p is 2, 
then look at the first series. After the third term onwards, everything is going to collapse and it will be just a quadratic polynomial. If P is 3, for example, look at the second parenthesis, the first two terms will remain. After that, everything will collapse and you get a cubic polynomial. If P is 5, the first three terms will survive and the rest will be 0 and you get a fifth degree polynomial, etc. So these polynomials are called Legendre polynomial. When P is an integer, exactly one of these two series terminates and we have a polynomial solution and the other one is a non-terminating power series and that will have unit radius of convergence. So check these things. With suitable normalizations that we shall presently specify, these polynomials are called Legendre polynomials. So we have finally obtained the Legendre polynomials up to some normalization. Remember that the Legendre's differential equation is a homogeneous differential equation. So if y of x is a solution, then constant times y of x is also a solution. So the normalization is necessary before we call them the Legendre polynomials. So let us define them clearly. Assume that p is an integer. Assume that p equal to k. And we have seen that one of the two series described above terminates into a polynomial solution f of x. Now we have to show that this polynomial solution f of x has the property that f of 1 is not 0. This polynomial does not vanish at x equal to 1. Why are we interested in the non-vanishing of this? Because the normalization that we are talking about is f of x upon f of 1. We have a polynomial solution already and we want to divide it by the value at 1. And that's how we normalize the Legendre polynomials. We do not take the L2 norm and divide. That's something that not done. So now how do we know that f of 1 is not 0? If f of 1 is 0, then we can't do this. So let us prove that f of 1 is not 0. Suppose not. Let us prove it by contradiction. Suppose that f of 1 is 0. Then look at the differential equation. What is the differential equation? 1 minus x squared y double prime. But 1 minus x squared y double prime will become 0. Minus 2xy prime plus p into p plus 1 y equal to 0. Now we assume that y of 1 is 0. That is the solution f of x vanishes at 1. So the third term in the Legendre differential equation also became 0. And the middle term therefore should give you f prime of 1 should be 0. So now we have f of 1 is 0 and f prime of 1 is also 0. Let us proceed by induction. Let us assume that the nth derivative of f at 1 is 0. We will prove that the n plus first derivative is also 0. Take the Legendre differential equation and differentiate the differential equation n times using the Leibniz rule for a product. You know how to find the nth derivative of a product of two things. In the Legendre's differential equation, you got the 1 minus x squared y double prime. You have to differentiate this n times. And the middle one will be minus 2xy prime. You have to differentiate that n times. Obviously, you have to use Leibniz rule. When you differentiate 1 minus x squared y double prime n times, what happens? At max, two derivatives can fall on 1 minus x squared. Beyond that, it will become 0. So all derivatives falling on y double prime and none on 1 minus x squared. But that will become 0 because 1 minus x squared vanishes when you put x equal to. Or one derivative falls on 1 minus x squared and n minus 1 derivatives fall on y double prime. That is minus 2x and the n plus first derivative of and you put x equal to 1 at the end of it. And you keep doing this and deal with the middle term also in the same way. Use induction hypothesis that all the derivatives obtained up to and including the nth derivative are all 0. Then you will conclude from there that the n plus first derivative will also be 0. And therefore, we have proved that all the derivatives are 0 and so f must be the 0 polynomial and that's a contradiction. So this contradiction shows that f of 1 is non-zero and this normalization is a valid normalization. So after this normalization, the normalized polynomial solution is called the Legendre polynomial. So, so since I taken p equal to k, this polynomial will have degree k. And I'm going to denote it by pkx. So we record its three properties 
the three properties of the Legendre polynomial are pkx is a polynomial of degree k, it satisfies the Legendre differential equation, its normalization pk of 1 is 1 and it's clear that pk is an odd function if k is odd and it's an even function if k is even. So and the 0th Legendre polynomial is a constant polynomial 1. I think it is a good place to stop this lecture here. Thank you very much. We will continue it next time.